last year. That doesn't count my driving time. I preached over 300 services since I was here last time. Now you just do, you do the math. That's in a year's time. I am, I am pastoring in Granite City, Illinois. I don't know what in the world went wrong with my brain. I am taking care of 22 other churches. I am mentoring 18 young men. And I sit on the board of six other churches trying to help them with uh, the situations that arise in them. And I love every minute of it. And I love, because it's all about the kingdom. It's not about what I think, what I want, what I, it's about the kingdom of God. And I am so thrilled I stand in this beautiful auditorium. And uh, I was here when it was just, uh, it was just a playhouse. It was a place to come and enjoy and have, have a lot of fun. And I, I remember when, when moved in here and, and, and had done some things. But this is so, so wonderful. And I, am, I guess if I could say it this way, and maybe you wouldn't be offended and maybe the Holy Joes wouldn't be offended either. I, I am sanctified proud for you. And I'd say, wow, but that might offend some of you. So since it probably would offend some of you if I said, wow, I won't say, wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Isn't God good? Well, I don't know what you came to do, but I came to praise the Lord. I don't know why you're sitting here, but I've come to magnify the Lord in this place. That's, that's too much bass for me. It's pulling on my throat. <clears throat> and uh, the lower ranges strip my voice in about five minutes. I'm not fussing, just explaining. I see a new man in the sound booth. This microphone is the weapon or the, the uh, tool that I have as much as the hammer is to the carpenter, the saw, and, and whatever. This is my tool, and if, if it's not used properly, then I'll preach to you tonight, and that will be it for the rest of the week. So I'd rather just be able to speak to you uh, the rest of the week than to have the lows just kill me. And uh, I don't want to be uncomfortable with you, but uh, yet I have to hear a certain sound. And uh, you singers are to identify with that. Don't matter if you're blowing them off the pews or the chairs out there. If you're not hearing up here, uh, then it, it, it's a difficult thing. Giving him a little chance. I'm not, uh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a little time giving him a chance to kind of make some adjustments. I'm going to be reading several verses of scripture tonight. I, I have something probably a little bit different than what I normally do when I, when I come to uh, the Bible church or go anywhere. I, uh, I don't do a lot of preaching anymore. Uh, I, I get up and I, I read a scripture too. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Uh, sometimes I just go to talking. Sometimes I just go to messing and gum and just whatever I feel to do because I learned a long time ago that the best way to have a successful service is to find out what God wants to do and get in there and do it with him. Not for him, but with him. And that's what I want to do in this service tonight. I want to be able to say when it is over, not that I've done what I wanted to do, not that I have uh, accomplished my purpose, but that I have found out what God wanted to do, and I am going to do it with him for the remaining part of this service. So if you have your Bibles and would like to turn with me, we're going to read from three separate uh, portions of Scripture that seem to be so totally unrelated in, in some ways, but yet they are all interconnected. In Luke chapter 7, Luke chapter 7, and we're going to begin to read there with verse uh, with verse 20, and I, aren't you glad we have the on-the-wall stuff now? 23, 23, and when the men were coming to him, they said, now, the him there is Jesus. It's all about Jesus, and he's the only source. I, I'm going to say that again, because you didn't catch that, or else they cut the speakers off in the house. 
Jesus is the only source. So if you want to know something, you got to go to Jesus. If you want to get something, you got to go to Jesus. If you want to see something, you've got to go to Jesus. John the Baptist has sent us unto thee, and he, he wanted us to say, are you the one that should come, or should we look for another? Now, I'm not a rocket scientist. I'm a little old dumb country boy from southwest Louisiana. I've been preaching a little over 55 years. Uh, I'm 39, don't care who knows it. I've been 39, I think, every time that I've ever come here. I see no reason to change it. It's worked before. It's still working, so I'm just going to do it. That'd be all right, won't it? Just as well be, because that's what I'm going to do. But not being a rocket scientist, I still don't quite understand John the Baptist or these disciples. Because look, look, in that same hour, he. Now, who's the he? Well, some of you paying attention. Cured many of their infirmities and plagues. Well, are you the one? Be healed. Be healed. Are you the one? Be healed. Be healed. <laughs> Crazy. And of evil spirits. And Unto many that were blind, he gave sight. But they're asking, are you the one? Are you the one? <laughs> My gracious. <laughs> then Jesus answering said unto them, go your way. Get out of my hair. What's wrong with you? Don't you have any understanding? Just go tell John. Oh, well, you're not answering the question, Jesus. Are you the one or do we look for another? No, 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 no. You're not listening. You're not listening. Just go tell John what things ye have seen and heard. How that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. To the poor the gospel is priest, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Wow. Wow. That's quite something, isn't it? Would you like to have all that? I've, I've heard a testimony or two here tonight, so we've seen some of it. So what are you waiting on? Well, we're going to read on a little bit more. Another portion of the scripture here. We're going to go to the book of, of Job. Oh, that sad, woe is me, Charlie Brown syndrome. Why is everybody always picking on me? Book. And in the book of Job, chapter 3, I'm only going to, or 31 rather, I'm only going to read the first part of the verse. I, I, uh, I, I'm not trying to take away, but it's just pertinent to what I'm going to. I made a covenant with mine eyes. Then we're going to go to the book of Lamentations. A lot of people don't even know that book's in the Bible. I cannot tell you in 55 years of preaching plus, I, I can probably count on one hand and have probably no fingers left standing. I, I, I just... Nobody preaches out of it. But here's what it said. My eye affecteth mine heart. And I want to talk to you a little bit tonight from a very simple title, more of a question. What do you see? What do you see? If you lift your hands and your hearts, let's give God praise for just a moment here tonight. Can we do it? Can we magnify him? He's worthy, worthy, worthy of all of our praise. I magnify his name. I give him glory and honor, for indeed he is the Lord of glory. 
Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, you can sit down if you won't sit down on me. Some of you are not quite sure what that means. We'll know in a few minutes what that means. What do you see? What do you see? Now, Job said, I made a covenant with mine eye. Why? Because the book of Lamentations says, my eye affected my heart, my soul. That's why you need to be careful what you read. That's why you need to be careful what you see. Oh, y'all don't like that, do you? Because see, we don't mind the preacher preaching alone so he don't get down to where we live. And then he goes to meddling and quit preaching. Well, I'm 39. I'll meddle all I want. And when you get up and walk out, everybody will know that you're the very one that is guilty of whatever it is I'm meddling about. Huh? A covenant is simply a vow. Or a promise. Actually, it is a legally binding contract. I made a covenant with my eye. What do you see? What do you see? What do you see? There are three eyes. Three eyes. First of all, there is the human eye. It's the human eye. It's a wondrous thing. You can see, kind of like the old man that was on the stand as an eyewitness and, and the attorney was trying to get him all confused and, and, and try to show that he didn't have very good eyesight. And, and so he said, well, just tell us how well do you see? He said, well, I see the sun every day and they tell me that's about 93 million miles away. The human eye is comprised of 138 million receptors or sensors or whatever you want to call them. About 130 of them are shaped like a little rod, a very tiny rectangle. And they are what give us the ability to see the black and whites of life. About 8 million of them are cone shaped. And that cone shape is what gives you the ability to see color. And what a dull world it would be if it didn't have color. What do you see? What do you see? What do you see? Then there's the carnal eye. Oh, we don't want to talk about that, do we? That's how the unholy, ungodly, negative... You see the negative eye, the negative spirit, the negative son, a tongue, is an unholy tongue. It's evil. If all that we gaze upon is that which is not Christ-like, then I cannot be Christ-like. But then there is the spiritual eye. Now, we have two eyes, human eyes, carnal eyes, or two. We are born with two eyes. And if we lose one, thank God we've still got another that we can kind of see with. But the spiritual eye is not two. It is only one. Because there is no division. With the spirit eye, you either see or you do not see. There is no division in the realm of the spirit with the spirit eye. I want you to remember these three things. The human eye, the carnal eye, and then the spiritual eye. Wish I had time really to preach on those, but I don't. That's just kind of laying you out. John sent his disciples to Jesus. And said, are you the one, or do we look for another? And the response of Jesus was simply 
what do you see? I hope you're getting this. In the same hour that they come to him, they saw the lame walk, the dumb talk, the deaf heard, the blind saw. Demon spirits cast out. Deliverance, peace, and joy. But we want to know, are you the one or do we look for another? Now some of you are bored out of your mind right now. You're so aggravated at me. You don't want me to stand up here and preach anything to you. You want that quarter in the slot. You want to see the performance. Oh, I said that looks sanctified holy at me. I know. I'm reading your spirits. I want to know what do you see? Boy's feet. Oh, they look like humongous feet. The only reason I know the boy's feet is because I know the picture. That's a boy's feet. A seven-year-old boy. A seven-year-old boy's feet. My Lord, look down at your feet, guys. You can't compete with him. You ain't nowhere near as big-footed as he is. Seven years old. I only know that because... Because if I just look at that picture, I think, my Lord, those feet, that must be a six foot six giant. No, it's a seven year old boy. The king of Assyria in 2 Kings chapter 6 was so mad and aggravated because every time he went to do something, a prophet of God saw it and circumvented it. And he's getting ready to kill a bunch of his own advisors because he thinks he's got a spy in the midst. And finally they tell him, hey, it's not us. There's an old prophet that is seeing. I want you to get a hold of what I'm saying. Oh, we're going to do some other stuff here, but I've got to get this in first. Because he was seeing every move that the king of Syria made he was able to circumvent the evil doings of the king. So he said, where is he? They said, he's in Dothan. So he sent an army to Dothan for one man. For one man. I'm going to tell you something. The devil makes you think that there's a little two and a half inch devil that sits on your shoulder and brings all the confusion and afflictions and maladies into your life and conquers you and that you're just so weak that one little two and a half inch devil is just giving you fits. But actually, there are armies, legions of devils that come against us every day because one little devil's not even anything. And the devil knows it's, it's not going to take one or two or a thousand or ten thousand, but it's going to take tens of thousands multiplied. So the next time you're having problems, don't feel like, oh, what am I doing? I can't even, I can't even whip the devil. You're fighting legions of spirits. That's when you call on the name of the Lord. Anybody remember the old statesman quartet? When Big Chief, Elvis Presley got some of his moves from Big Chief. Oh, that's the truth. Jay Cass was one of their lead singers. And there used to be a song that they sang, well, there's been so many times when I didn't have a dime, couldn't call nobody but the Lord. But you know he heard my plea, came down to see about me. He's my all in all. When they push me down, he picks me up, stands by me. When the going gets rough, I've got the Lord. 
I've got the Lord. And that's enough. That's enough. That's enough. Some of you need to see what you have. Or maybe you need to see what you don't have. Come on, Bobby, wake up. And so, the servant of the prophet Elisha went out. I don't know, maybe he's going to get the daily newspaper. I'm not sure why he was out, but he was out. And he runs back in, frightened out of his mind. Because... Fear and trembling with a fearful, tremulous voice. He says, oh, we're in a heap of trouble. Why? Because I saw a huge army out there. And something tells me they didn't come in peace. But they've come in war. What are we going to do? There's no sword in the house. There's no spear. There's no bow. There's no arrows. There's no weapons of defense. What are we going to do? The prophet, first of all, said, Fear not. The reason that most of us are afflicted, whether it's physically emotionally, spiritually, financially, is because we are full of fear. Somebody's still not liking what I'm doing, still waiting on the quarter to kick in. Fear not. Fear is the exact opposite of faith. She demonstrated when she said, I'm not going to worry about it. Whatever. Now, uh, if, if one of my kids, when, when they were at home, had walked up to me and said, whatever, when they woke up, they'd have a different attitude. Oh, I know it's a novel idea, but parents are supposed to be in charge. I know that's not the philosophy of today. But kids aren't supposed to run parents. And speaking of running, oh, well, I better hush. <laughs> and then the second thing that the prophet did, he gave a prophetic word, fear not. Oh, no, he didn't say, Oh, the saith the Lord of hosts, blah, 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 yada, 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 yada. He just said, Fear not! And then he prayed, secondly. And he prayed, Lord, open his eyes. Why? So that he can see. What do you see? I see a picture of feet would know that it's boy's feet unless you had been told. So all you would say is, I see a picture of feet. Uh, uh, Pastor, don't get too nervous. I'm not anywhere near through with this. God's going to heal some people here tonight. God's going to set some people free from chains and fetters. And when the servant became the recipient of faith and prayer, he looked and the mountains and the valleys and the crevices and the rocks and everywhere that his eye could see was filled with chariots and horses and an army that God had sent. Now then, what do you see? Now then, where's your fear? Now then, 
I went for a routine checkup. Not because I wanted to, but because I have an insurance policy that in order to keep it key man, I have to have a physical every year. Don't like it. Don't enjoy it. Had my way, I'd never go. But I don't have, oh, I've got a choice. But I'm trying to take care of my wife if something happens to me. I'm worth a whole lot more dead than I am alive. So if I die in mysterious circumstances, somebody investigate. And I go in and they do all these tests and then he, this doctor comes out and he's, he's, he's upset. He's upset. And he said, Reverend, you need to go right on in. We need to do something. And I said, well, what's going on? And he said, well, he said, your PSA is 24. Now, you may not know what that means, but usually, if it's in the five or six range, they say you're under a sentence of death at five or six. Mine was at 24. He said, you can't go home. We've got to, put you, we've got to do some radical stuff. And I said, no thanks. What are you going to do? I'm going home. You can't go home. Well, don't tell me I can't go home. I've got a vehicle out there. I can get in it, and it'll crank. And I can drive it home. Don't tell me I can't go home. But I forgot that when I walked in there and filled out those forms, that I gave permission for them to call my house. And be a tattletale, a blabbermouth. And when I pulled into the garage, my wife is standing at the door. Said, "What are you doing home? This is where I live." The doctor's office called. Why did you stay? I said, "Nope, not going to." Said, "Yes, you are." I said, "No, I'm not." But does anybody know anything about women? No, you don't. You just think you do. They don't play fair. I walked past her, ignored her, knew I'd suffer for it. <laughs> Pretty soon, into my driveway come my daughter and two grandsons. The big one ran in and hit me here, and the little one ran in and hit me there, and they wrapped their arms around there, weeping and crying. And Holly comes in, just say, yeah, 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 yeah. Dad, you got to, Dad, you got Dad, you got Dad, you got Dad, you know better than this. And my grandkids cried, oh, Papa, please don't die. Please, Papa, don't die. Oh, Papa, please don't die. I said, all right, I'll go, but I won't go until after the weekend because we got service Sunday. Had to sit down and explain. Yeah, they saw this. They saw that. This is the report. Got up Sunday morning and was ready to start the service. And an elder in my church that served as pastoral assistant for many, many years stood up and said, Pastor, uh, can, I, can I say something? I trust this man. I trust him. Trust him literally with my life. I do. And I knew that he would not say or do anything that would be out of order. I said, come on, Brother Chester. Come on. I called him to the platform. I didn't make him stand out there. Called him to the platform and gave him the microphone. And you see, women don't play fair. And he said, our pastor has prayed for us. We have been miraculously healed. Delivered and set free. He's under a sentence of death and is going back tomorrow. And we need to pray for him. He had me stand in front of the pulpit on the floor. About 50 of the men that were in the service that morning and not involved in other parts of the, of the operation, they gathered around me and they began to pray. 
And I can tell you the very moment that it happened. I knew. I knew. I got up Monday because I had given my word. Besides that, it was too cold at my house to continue as it was. It's the truth. Don't sit there and look holy like your little sweet angel, darling. You know how to get your way. All oh, you wives do. Yeah, sit there and look. I go in. And they're doing biopsies, and they did 27 biopsies. 27. More blood work. One of the leading men in our part of the country working out of Memorial Hospital, the head of this whole doctor's firm that do nothing but that, had told me before he started, he said, I do not know how you are living. I've never in all the years that I've practiced and never have I even read of a case where a PSA has been 24. You should not be alive. He said, we've got to get you in here. He said, you've got to sign this form. I said, what's this form? He said, that when we get in there, we can do it. I said, no, I don't think so. You do what you said to me you were going to do, which is biopsy. I don't, want, I don't want no extras. He didn't like it, but he had no choice. I wouldn't sign it. And I didn't give anybody else permission to sign it either. <laughs> I learned something. When they got through, he come to me with his before, with his after. He said, I do not understand. But your PSA is zero, zero, point, one, two. They had kept what they had done the week before, so they thought it was something that they had done wrong. But when they did it, it was 24. But the new was, oh, what do you see? Everybody, oh, you're about to get it. Everybody was seeing 24. But thank God I had one man that didn't care what he saw, that wasn't concerned about what he heard. He was looking beyond that. And I got a miracle. And I'm still here, and things are still unbelievably good. My last checkup, the doctor told me, he said, Reverend, I don't know what's going on. He said, it looks like the aging process has not only stopped in some of your areas in your life, but they're regressing. You're actually getting better from your last year's report. I believe that that is the touch of God. You believe what you want. I'd like to tell some of you that are sitting on these chairs today, fear not. What do you see? I see feet. Big feet. In order to please the Jews, Herod saw that when he killed James, it just made him just rejoice. So he reached out and he grabbed Peter. He put him in prison behind three iron gates or doors. The church was afraid, fearful. But somehow, even in the midst of their fear, they began to pray because they were afraid that the same thing that had happened to James was going to happen to Peter. And so they gathered at the house of Mary and they began to have an old-time prayer meeting. Peter was so upset over his circumstances that he is sacked out. He is sound asleep. He wasn't worried that he was not only in a prison cell, he was behind three iron gates. 
And when the angel appeared, the angel actually had to shake him awake. Huh. Sounds kind of like us when we get in difficulties. No, doesn't really. And they went, and each door or gate opened to them, the Bible said, of his own accord. Now, who is the his? Think about that. And so when he got out on the streets, he goes to the house of Mary. And he... And apparently one of the teenage girls wasn't as spiritual as some of the others. Wasn't caught away in the spirit of prayer because she heard the knocking. Or maybe she was just more attentive. And she runs to the door and apparently Peter on the outside is saying, Hey, I'm here. Y'all let me in. Because she didn't open the door. Oh, you thought she did? Go back and read it. She didn't open the door when she heard his voice. She ran back in and disrupted the prayer meeting and said, Hey, 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 Peter's at the door. He's here. He's here. And they said, You're nuts. Well, the Bible said, Thou art mad. We'd say, You're nuts. You're crazy. Peter's in prison. What do you see? But Peter kept knocking and then they said well it's not him it's his angel or his spirit you know some people love to send their spirits to church I'd rather you keep your spirits at home with you we have enough spirits to contend thank God Peter didn't give up he just kept on now some of you still bored out of your gourd but Hold on a little bit. And they let him in. And they saw for themselves that indeed it was Peter. What do you see? What do you see? Now, I'm going to tell you the story of this set of feet that belong to a seven-year-old boy. His feet are not really that big. Apparently, it's the angle of the photo. He's just a normal seven-year-old boy. The problem was he had rheumatoid arthritis. His markers were beyond the 80% markers, and I'm, I, apparently that's super, super, super bad. His feet were turned, and he walked on his ankles. They did surgery and tried to straighten them, and they went right back. They put him in braces, and it looked like his feet were halfway normal, but if you'd looked, you'd have seen that there was a bowing and there was, you could tell something was wrong. I was in Bethalto, Illinois, at Landmark Pentecostal Church where I've been preaching for many, many years. Not as many as here, but many years. And I'd been praying for people and things had been happening. People were being healed. Sister Burke, the pastor's wife, motioned to me because I did not see this seven-year-old boy come up with his mother and dad. They were standing way over, like kind of past where the organ would be. So it was kind of out of the mainstream of what was going on. And Sister Burke got my attention. And I walked over there and I, I knelt down and I said, What do you want? And he said, without any hesitation, he said, I came to be healed. I wish we'd get that. we come get prayed for. we come to get anointed. we come to get a little touch. You come on, try, pass them on by. 
But he said, I came to be healed. So I reached out to him, and I simply said, be healed in Jesus' name. And then I reached down, and I touched him. When I did, the braces were hidden by, by his clothing, and I felt those old cold, hard braces. I couldn't touch the flesh because it was surrounded by the braces. But, but braces don't mean anything to God. And though I couldn't touch his physical ankle, I touched those braces and I said, be healed. And I just walked off. He looked up at his mother and dad and said, I'm healed. No lightning flash. No thunder roll. No earth shaking. Went home and we were sitting at the table eating. They would taken me out after the service and Sister Burke got a text from the boy's mother and said, he insisted that we take his braces off. The doctors told us from the beginning, don't take his braces off. But he insisted. And when we did, he stood and his ankles were one and a half inches from the floor. Oh, but that's, that's not the miracle. He's still nearly walking on his ankle. He's walking. He looked at his mom and dad and he said, I want to throw these braces in the trash. No. You don't know what these things cost. Son, you know, we got all the explanations about why we can't have our miracle. But that daddy decided to honor the faith of that seven-year-old boy and let him hobble on ankles that were no longer flat on the floor as they were before prayer without braces, now they're an inch and a half, still hobbling on the sides of his feet to the trash. And when he threw his braces in the trash, he gained about two and a half inches in height because his feet turned. You see feet! I see a miracle. You see Pete, but I see a miracle. The doctor saw 24, but I saw a God that has been my healer for all of these years. Why in the world would he stop now? I spent one night in the hospital in 1954. I resented it then. I resent it now. If I have to go, I don't want a back world, third world country doctor working on me. I want the very best. That's why I have gone to the great physician. I've gone to the one who is the physician of all physicians. He's the master physician. He can heal my body. He has healed me so many times. He sets me free from the chains and the bonds that come against me. What do you see in this service today? I see a beautiful auditorium that somebody had to have a vision because it was just an old concrete, metal-sided building that was thrown up out here to come and have fellowship and play basketball and play games and have a supper every once in a while and fellowship and picnics but somebody saw a church you're sitting here today and you see a beautifully carpeted floor 
a nice platform. It's not totally finished yet, but some of you are finally beginning to see, wow, this is going to be something. This is, this is nice. This is nice. This is nice. But that's all you see. That's all you see. But I saw, along with your bishop and along now with your pastor, I saw a long time ago, I've told you innumerable times, that God was going to bring revival to the Bible church. He was going to honor the foundation that this church is built upon. He's going to honor the faithfulness of Pop Simonson and then of Bishop Simonson. And he's going to honor the faithfulness of Pastor. He's going to do it. 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 What do you see? Is this, is this what we should be looking for? Is this, is, are, 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 why don't you open your eyes and see? Your miracle is standing at the door. It is knocking. Your miracle is waiting on somebody to say, I don't care if you've been in prison. I don't care if you're under a sentence of death in your party. I don't care what the situation is. I don't care if you're a drug addict. I don't care if you're an alcoholic. I don't care what your situation is. Your miracle, your miracle, your miracle is knocking at the door. Quit looking at your problem. Quit looking at the circumstance and lift up your eyes and see your miracle. Broken bones, Sister Bracken, mean nothing to God. I can't hear a thing up here. Help me out. Broken bones mean nothing to God. No, you're not seeing it. I'm not seeing a broken wrist. I'm seeing a whole hand. A CC member, trying to be nice and not say Church of Christ. I can say that because my maternal grandmother was Campbellite Church of Christ. You don't even know what that means. The Church of Christ that exists today don't have a clue what that means. But they're harder than any tins of steel. She came. She had a cast on a leg, broken. We were in service and of course that particular denomination does not believe in miracles. They do not believe in talking in tongues. In fact, they, they teach that talking in tongues is of the devil. And when she come to that revival, there were miracles and tongue talking. And she knew some of them and so, she said, all right, God, if this is real, I'm going up there and you're going to heal my leg. But God did more than heal her leg. When I laid hands on her, God filled her with the Holy Ghost. Oh, you, you, you say... She couldn't get the Holy Ghost right then because she hadn't spent six months in the altar snotting and weeping and crying a bucket full of tears. Why don't you let God be God and you quit judging whether people are ready or not? Can't get the Holy Ghost wrong. If you get it, you got it right. And talking in tongues is not the Holy Ghost. It's only the evidence 
a momentary evidence. The proof of the Holy Ghost is the life that you live. Boy, she'd done about as much as she could do with that big old heavy cast. She went home and got a hacksaw. I don't know how she kept from cutting her leg off. But she cut that cast off. 77 years of age. She cut that cast off of her leg and come back the next night leading when the saints go marching in. She was ahead of the victory march, a dancing and rejoicing. What do you see? Oh, I see this poor old 77 year old woman. You know, I used to talk about people 77 being old, but that ain't nowhere near old. Somebody asked me how old I was. I said, I'm between 50 and 90. Heavy on the other end. You just wish you'd look as good as I look when you get to be my age. You wish you could get around like I get around when you get to be my age. These folks at the Bible Church know I've been coming here since what, 69, 70? Somewhere in there. I come when Pop Simonson was still working. That's been a day or two ago. Some of you don't even know about that. In fact, some of you don't really even know Brother Pop Simonson. But I, I've been coming here a long time. And I've seen a lot of things happen here. And I've seen a lot of, a lot of people that have gone different places because maybe, maybe they're looking for something a little more high class or hearty toity or... I remember before y'all was married. Y'all just bad little old kids running around here. It's the truth. I've been coming here that long. He looks sanctified holy now. But I'll keep my mouth shut. You can pay me later. And I remember the violin and the trombone and the trumpets. I remember Sister Millie leading a choir. You don't really know who that is, do you? I remember it. And I remember one night when there was a breakthrough, and it was one of the first breakthroughs uh, in latter days for the Bible church. Bishop was here as youth leader, and he was kind of leading the choir along with, I guess, Sister Millie. He had his trumpet. He'd sing a oh, while, wow, that red hair. Lot of it. Lot of it. When he blew that trumpet, you thought Gabriel had come on the scene. He could play that thing. And they began to sing that song. Get all excited. Go tell everybody that Jesus Christ is King. I said, get all excited. Go tell everybody that Jesus Christ is King. I said, and something. He ran across that platform, Bishop, and grabbed that trumpet and begin to play the notes of that get all excited. And something happened. The girl with the violin come to Pop Simonson, who was the pastor then, Leah, your dad. That's when you really were 29. About a hundred years ago, but that's when it was. <laughs> I know because I was there right with her and still am. And still am. She just decided to start telling the truth about her age. I'm not going to. I'm 39. Don't care who knows. She come and she said, Pop. I know she called him Pastor. Something's happened to me. Because we was going to close the revival that Sunday night. We'd already been there two or three weeks. And he believed what she said. And he extended the revival. And something happened in the Bible church. The progression, the swelling, the leaking out. If you had everybody, 
that were in other churches within just a very short distance of here, back here, five buildings this size would not hold them. I preached at the Bible church when it was running more than Calvary Tabernacle. I preached at the Bible church when the TP was the hot spot of Pentecost. I preached at the Bible church when, when the Bible church was the place to be. Yes, been there. Been there, done that. I've been there when the building was so packed that there was no room. I've been there the night when I left the office that was given me and I had to, I, I went outside to keep from having to go through the auditorium and I was on one side. Was, in fact, I actually was in the room that actually became Bishop's office there on, the, on this side of the building if you're standing at the platform. And, and I was supposed to join Pop Simonson, so I, I walked around the building. Walked his, and when I walked in, he wasn't ready to come in the service. He was on his face, and he was talking to God. And I know he's talking to God because he's talking in tongues and praying in tongues. And the Bible says when you do that, you're talking to God, you're praying to God. So I left there, and I decided I'd go where, where Brother Jones... And all the rest of those exalted potentates, high order, Brother Richmond, two or three others on that usher staff, went into the room that they used, a great big old table there. But they weren't ready to come into service either. Every one of them was talking to God. So I did, I'll just go in by myself. I walked in that door. I couldn't see a head in that building. I thought, dear God, I knew I wasn't a good preacher. It looked like somebody to showed up for church tonight. But then when I began to look, people were knelt between those old theater seats on that old hard tile floor. Up here in this little area, Nick here was Nick here was a was, was where they bought the deaf mutes and set them that and was it Brother Brother West? Was he the first one? Kind of a big balding Kind of stout kind of fella? Was that, am I, am I saying that right? Some of you, who? Junior Creighton. He said, man, and, and he had a group of them around him, and they, you know, they couldn't talk. They couldn't hear. All they could do was watch his face. All they could do is see. He's wiggling his fingers. They were weeping and crying. And, and, and the old sister, before, before uh, Lorraine played the piano, Addison, okay, okay, sitting back over here. Leah, you were sitting for some reason back over there. The platform was such that if you stood on the platform, you had a panoramic view because it's a round building, nightmare. And I'm standing there, and all of a sudden, both of you jumped up like you were in a race to see who could get to the instrument first. And if I'm not mistaken, the organ was on this side and the piano was on that side. And she raced to the piano and, and Leah, you raced to the organ. Any, am, am, am I dreaming this stuff? Some of you ought to be old enough. Maybe you're too old. You can't remember anymore. I don't know. And you sit down and I'm watching, I'm watching because you're not communicating. And both of you got it in you. You're going to play and you're going to... And Lord, oh, my ears and no telling what's going on. She's going to play. Aren't she? But no, they sat down in their hands and I'm watching because I backed off and I could see both. And at the same time, they hit their instruments and begin to play the same song in the same key. And it wasn't a rockabilly song. It was an old song that was a sweet, Sweet Spirit, in this place, and I know that it's the Spirit of the Lord. Something began to move. People began to come off of the floor, begin weeping, talking to God. In this little corner, these that cannot hear, that cannot speak, are weeping. One young man, I wish I could remember his name, kind of thin, jet black hair. 
He was one of them. He was one of them. And he, he wiggled his fingers and said, Why do I feel like this? And the translator said, It's because Jesus is here. And he stood up. And he's looking around. He's looking around. And he goes back and he goes, I never did understand how they could wiggle their fingers and it made any kind of sense. I don't understand that. He said, where is he? He was like, you see, they're very limited. No one had ever communicated to him about Jesus. And so, I guess his brother Crater said, it's the Lord. It's God. And he said, why is he making me cry? Then this is his fingers. He said, because he wants you to let him come into your heart. He says, how do I do that? And brother, I said, you ought to repent. And he stopped him. What does that word mean? He did not know what the word repent meant. Because you see, they're very limited in their vocabulary. He said, well, just tell God you're sorry. That's about as good as anything I can tell you. Just tell God you're sorry. And he did. And that young man, thin, about six foot, jet black hair, very nice looking young man, probably somewhere between the age of 18 and 20, that was born without anything in his ears to hear with. There was nothing connected there because it didn't exist. His vocal cords, his voice box did not exist. He was born without the ability to produce sound. But he stood, closed his eyes, and then he really began to see. Sometimes we need to shut our eyes so that we can see. And I'm standing there in awe, watching what's... And then he comes out in the aisle, and he begins to dance in the most beautiful way, dancing in move. I've never seen anything that graceful in all of my life. And he's circling this building, this round auditorium. No corners in it, but if there had been a corner, he finally come to a rest. What would have been the back corner there? Only it wasn't a corner. And so I come off the platform. I'm telling you, that's Bible church. This is you. This is your heritage. And when I go back there, I'm just, wow. Oh, excuse me. I'm just, whoo. And I run back and got Albert Vaughn and run him back there. Did not say anything to him. And when he got back there, one of the probably only times I ever saw any spiritual visible demonstration from Albert Vaughn. Now, I'm not, I'm not criticizing, but he just, he wasn't kind of, to, but, but he broke loose. He actually danced. If the church could have seen him, half of them would have passed out. Because he didn't do that. And all in all, I took 11 men back there without saying one thing to any of them. And every one of them broke loose. Because when we got back there, this boy, young man, that had nothing to produce sound, was speaking loudly, clearly, in other tongues, as the Spirit gave him the utterance.
What do you see tonight? There are miracles that are waiting to happen right now. Where's my seven-year-old boy? that will look at his daddy and say, I, I'm going to go. You take me. I'm going to be healed. Where's my seven-year-old boy that will say, throw those braces in the trash because there's no need for me to keep them. To keep them is, is like saying God's not doing it. Say, God's healed me. And then they're thrown in the trash. Feet straightened. Or if you don't believe this story, you call Pastor Mark Burke, pastor of Landmark Pentecostal Church in Bethalto, Illinois. I have his phone and his wife's phone on my phone. I give to the sound man tonight this picture that was a direct text from her and in that she texted about, but that's not the end of the story. It passed you by that he had rheumatoid arthritis from the waist down, his joints, his feet, everything. Guess what he doesn't have tonight? Not on choice! Not only did God straighten his feet up, God has healed that boy of his rheumatoid arthritis. What do you see tonight, church? What do you see? Oh, but I've got this problem. I'm bound by nicotine. I'm bound by, I'm bound by liquor. I'm bound by drugs. I'm bound. No, no, no. I don't see it. I see Jesus. And when you see Jesus, you've seen it all. Because if you can ever get a glimpse of him, and if you can ever make your way and touch the hem of his garment, you shall be made whole. Still not seeing, are we? You're still waiting on me to do what I do, calling you out. Laying hands on you. You're still, you're still waiting on me. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen until you see for yourself. If we could believe it tonight, we could send healing from this place to Jay Bracken. And he could sleep tonight through and the pain that he's going through could be taken from him if you could see it what do you see sis you see that God is a miracle worker what kind of miracle do you see he can do all things and anything and everything now then what's he going to do for your faith tonight. Huh? <laughs> In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, let that touch of your spirit flow from the top of her head to the bottom of her feet now in healing virtue. Mm. Huh. Hallelujah! Uh, we're not into it, are we? We're just going to sit back there and say, oh, well, you know, she's just getting a little old touch here. Yeah. No, no, no. What are you seeing tonight? By the authority that's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let it flow into this life now. Huh. 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 What do you see tonight? 
What are you waiting on? Are you waiting on the preacher to call you out? Are you waiting on me to describe your situation? Are you waiting for me? Are you just going to say, in the name of Jesus Christ, by the authority, let virtue flow, let it flow from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet now in Jesus There is an unprecedented revival that is in the horizon. Actually, it's beyond the horizon. It's in the atmosphere of this building tonight. The Bible church is destined to be a recipient of one of the most powerful moves of God that has ever been seen in this part of the country. Ah, uh, that's just an old white-haired man telling you. No! God showed it to me several years ago. I saw it. And like waves, like rain that comes down so hard that you can't see through it. And then the wind starts blowing and you can actually see that the rain changes direction. And when it changes direction, that, that's what I'm seeing in the power of the Holy Ghost tonight. Oh, in the name of Jesus Christ, let it let it happen. Let it happen in this body, in this life now. The power, let strength, let healing, let loosing from the pain and infirmity that has gripped this body. The ravages, the ravages of, of accidents now are restored by the power of the Holy Ghost. What do you see tonight? What do you see tonight? Now, when your pain goes, will you accept your healing? You're going to feel like somebody's going to heat your hand. That's going to be much when you feel that. In the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke this infirmity. I command the touch of healing virtue to fall right now into her back. Loose her, not only from the pain, but loose her from the problem that has caused the pain now in Jesus' name. Oh, come on, believe it. I feel it. I feel it. There's a touch of God. There's a touch of God. You are the answer. You are the answer. You are the answer. You are the answer. In the name of Jesus Christ, let the Holy Spirit of God put her life. Let it touch her body and soul tonight. Jesus, I believe you to do what no one else can do. Oh. Jesus, 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 I believe. I want to see you. Oh, Jesus. 